I wanted to do something a little different. Um, instead of like a software type tutorial, I wanted to talk more about the business side of things. So I have been freelancing now since I want to say 2007. So about 13 years. Um, I feel like that ages me a lot, but when I graduated, I graduated into the recession and a lot of the jobs I had to take on were contract work. Um, and it was just, it was kind of like the wild west. So I had to figure out pretty quick, um, ways to hustle and make money and graphic design, freelance work, web design, um, any type of creative work in terms of marketing, social media, I managed to basically keep myself afloat. I actually got laid off of my very first job out of college um, <laughs> within like, let's say four months um, because the recession hit. And um, I went back to work in retail, but wanted to keep my portfolio strong. So the best way I found to do that was to freelance. And that's kind of like how this whole freelance life came about. I've always been working multiple jobs and one of those jobs often was me freelancing working with small businesses and clients outside of the traditional sense when I think way back to young 20 something Jenny um, <laughs> I think about those initial freelance jobs that I would take on and, and I say contracts but when I think about it I actually didn't have contracts and that ended up biting me in the butt on more than one occasion. But before I go into like the tips and the reasons why I think contracts are important, keep in mind I'm not a lawyer, um, so don't take this as legal advice, but I'm really good at researching and over the last 13 years I think I've been able to create a solid contract that I use time and time again with clients. Um, but it is so important to use a contract because you don't want to be like if you are a young 20 something just starting out freelancing, you don't want to be young Jenny back then not getting paid after doing work um, and clients not following through on their financial sides or projects taking longer than they need to because clients aren't giving you what you, you know you need to get the work done. I think contracts are a vital part of the business when it comes to freelancing. Um, some people will say that an email is considered a non-formal contract and in many states it is, I believe in Illinois you can have a verbal agreement written agreement through an email and that's considered a contract but for me personally i like to have a solid document way back when um i reached out to the lawyers for the creative arts which is an amazing nonprofit based in chicago that focuses on just that law support pro bono work for people in the creative industries and that was basically um, the birthing area of my contract. I was able to work with a pro bono lawyer to kind of establish the groundwork for my contract. I also, um, I am a huge, huge advocate for um, the handbook uh, for pricing and ethical guidelines. This is a very, very old version. This is like the first one I ever purchased. Um, this is a handbook by the Graphic Artists Guild, and this one is from, let's see, this one's from 2003. So keep that in mind, I purchased this views probably in like 2005 or 2006, right when like I was entering and starting to freelance in college, um, and this, this baby like took me all the way. It's helped me with pricing, it's helped me with creating contracts and this is a very very old very old version of it and now I have the most recent one I just bought it um I want to say a few months ago the most most recent version of this it's very similar but um this is just this is another like this is another resource you can utilize when, when building a contract I would say this my time with the lawyers for creative arts and then just research over the years has really helped me. Let's start with the basics. What is a contract? Basically, a contract is a legal agreement between two or sometimes more parties um, where they agree on a specific arrangement. So 
in my case, often it's either graphic design, illustration, surface pattern work, marketing, branding, um, social media work, sometimes website work. Um, and we agree on what the project is, what the project scope is, what I'm going to charge, when I'm going to get payment, um, when things are due from not just me, but also my client. And basically, this contract organizes the arrangement I have with my clients. If necessary, it can also be used in court as proof to defend yourself in case of a dispute when it comes to working with a client. More or less, it's kind of a way to protect yourself when it comes to doing business in the creative realms um, and with clients. It can also be used to pretty much organize the scope of a project. That's kind of how I, I use the contract. Um, it allows me to kind of have like a properly organized document where I can detail out the scope of the project that I'm going to work on, what kind of work I'll be doing, um, what kind of work I won't be doing, when payment is due, um, and it's just a really great way to communicate with my clients their needs as well as my needs, and I lay it out in layman's language. I don't use very much legal verbiage in it, um, but this allows me to be really, really clear on what I'm offering my client and what my client can expect to get from me. So without a freelance contract in place within your business, you kind of are leaving yourself open to things like non-payment. That's like when I think of 20-something year old Jenny working on projects, long nights, getting something out, and then a client essentially ghosting me. We didn't have that word back in 2008, 2007, but that's what would happen. Um, it also can leave you open to liability and potential legal trouble. So this is just a really smart, surefire way to um, add a bit of professionalism to the work that you're doing as a freelancer. What I want to talk about now is looking at what a contract should include. So basically kind of like a clear introductory statement is always really important. And we're going to go into more details into some of these as well. I like to have terms and conditions within it. A scope of the project which is probably one of the bigger aspects of what I include um, and the scope of the project is essentially the biggest aspect that I have in there and I often take that scope because I like to include things like deadlines what the client needs to get me and what I need to get the client and I take that scope essentially and translate it over into my Trello document and if you saw my video on how to use Trello when you're working with clients you'll get a better idea of what I use my scope in. So I take basically the, the whole scope portion of my contract and I just dump it into Trello so that there's deadlines, information, places for clients to upload elements or documents and things like that. And that's kind of how I, I incorporate the contract into the Trello boards that I work with when it comes to working with my clients. I include information on changes and revisions especially when it comes to um, graphic design, illustration, web design work, branding, marketing, stuff like that, where you're working with creative, you're working with artwork. Um, often clients want to be able to look at something and if they want to offer revisions, give revisions, but I like to include how many revisions I'm allowing and allotting my client because if you don't, you'll get revision after revision after revision. And again, this reminds me back to like 20 year old Jenny who didn't know any better. And when I think about the hours I put into projects, I was probably getting paid less than minimum wage for some of these things. So adding changes and revisions is really important because it tells them how many changes, how many revisions they get, um, and what the turnaround typically is for those. I also include any type of legal language relating to my state, specifically Illinois. I add information on copyright, um, whether or not, especially when it comes to like the surface pattern design work, whether I'm licensing work out or I'm selling it outright. Typically when I'm selling things outright, it's a more expensive deal. Um, I then I also include information on payment, payment terms, when I expect payment. Um, typically I always get a deposit before I begin any type of work for anyone. Um, just because again, cash Jenny, Young Jenny didn't do those things and I had to learn the hard way. I always, always, always highly suggest you get a deposit to start work. Um, it just, again, it shows the seriousness of 
um, the project. It shows that the client is ready to put the work and effort in. It shows that you have something to work off of um, in terms of giving your time, efforts, and energy as well. I do put in a clause on termination. If a client doesn't like something, they pay me for the work up until that point, and then they're able to cancel the rest of the contract. Um, and then, of course, signatures so that I am legally signing off that I'm approving of this, and then same when it comes to the client. Now I want to dive a little bit deeper on how to actually create a freelance contract, and, a, and I outline it almost like a template because I reuse it over and over again. I create either, you can do it in Word, I have a Google Doc that you can just update as you go, um, and then export it with the updated information for whatever project I'm working on. Um, and a lot of my projects are kind of similar, so the scope often will stay the same. I just have to update things like names and company names and things like that. So the first part that I have in my contract is a very clear introductory statement um, to what I'm doing. It's really self-explanatory. Um, it just simply introduces the main parties of the contract agreement and it offers a really short overview of what the agreement is, what it entails, what the project is, and then I include um, a sentence that kind of outlines, you know, terms and conditions below. Um, so for the sake of it just being simple, this section of the contract should also establish like who the client is and who the contractor is um, so that both parties will be referred to that throughout the rest of the agreement so that you're not writing you know, certain things over and over again. Um, your short overview should describe what in very, very general terms you're, you'll be doing for the client. Finally, you'll want to include a mutually agreed upon start date. Then I also like to include information on when that end date is going to be. And usually I'm going to establish that start date and that end date um, over maybe either a phone conversation or email. Email is usually how I do a lot of my work. It's just easier for myself. It's easier for the clients. The terms and agreement, this is where you basically can't afford to allow any confusion. This is where you're outlining in detail what you're doing. These are the key expectations with your client, um, what they are looking for, what you are providing. So whether they're tasks you're expected to do or items that you expect to receive from the client that kind of help you to accomplish your job, um, this is the section of your freelance contract where you clearly outline what those expectations are. So typically I like to begin my terms and conditions by establishing what I want for my client, um, principally what the agreed level of payment is, how it should be paid, when payment is due. Um, and ideally you'll have already agreed to that arrangement beforehand. Like I said, I like to do this over email. Um, so people prefer it over phone. Um, and Typically, you'll probably have a contract that's paid by the job versus by the hour. I always suggest you pay um, you request payment based on the scope of the work. It, it, you know, typically they're not paying me for the number of hours I put into a job. I find that my clients are paying me for my skills, my expertise, and all the years of experience that I have that I can put into the work that I'm doing for them. And, it's taken me 13, you know, 13 to 15 years to get to a point where maybe something that might take one contractor 10 hours to do and they can charge $25 an hour, I can do it in an hour, um, but I'm not going to charge $250 because of the amount of effort and energy and my skill set that goes into that. So keep that in mind. It's really a personal preference in terms of what you want to do, if you want to get paid hourly or if you want to get paid per job. Um, personally, I choose a ladder just because it makes more sense for my background and my experience and the type of work and projects that I'm doing. And by having your payment rate specified very clearly at the very beginning of the section, you can avoid any potential disagreement afterwards. Like I said, I'd like to agree on this before I even put the energy into creating a contract um, because that could be something that a client can come back at and say, well, this is too much. Why, what is this? And in reality, if you're agreeing upon this, earlier in the communication phase, then it's something that you don't even have to worry about. If you and the client agree to an upfront deposit, um, followed by one or maybe more progress payments, I like to do that. I do a deposit, a midpoint payment, and then my final payment is due upon 
receipt of final assets of the project. I like to outline that in my deliverables um, within this section as well. These milestones basically should be outlined and specified here too with specific dates and I even go as detailed at specific times. If I'm getting you something by 8 a.m., I'm gonna expect, you know, payment by this time. So it's really important to be detailed. I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record <laughs> when it comes to this part, but you have to be really, really detailed here, enough so that there's no grounds for confusion. Um, you don't want to be unclear in anything that you're doing. There should be, you know, no room for assumptions. You want to very, very, clearly paint out what you're doing, when you're doing it, what your expectations are. Because um, again, it leaves no room for misinterpretation. Now the next section I want to talk about is the scope of the project. This is probably the part that takes me the longest because it's, like I said, I use my contract as a template and what I typically do is a lot of these sections are just solid, I just maybe have to update a name, I don't have to change it much. But the scope of the project aspect is something that I do have to change. I include deadlines and outlines for both myself as well as the client. So I have to sit there and look at a calendar and, you know, based on if I'm going to turn this around in two weeks, when am I going to get what done? When do I need things from the client in order to get started on that? Um, so this is the part that tends to take me the longest personally. Um, and Sometimes it can be one of the more frustrating elements of, uh, of, the, of the contract, but it's one of the most important aspects of it, especially to ensure that you're not overworking or overproviding um, based on your needs as a freelancer. Um, if the client asks for extra tasks or add-ons or an unreasonable number of revisions um, as you progress through the project, that increases the scope of the project. And I make it so that I outline in my scope that, you know, this is the number of revisions or changes that you may get, but if you want more, I'm happy to do so, but I do have to revise the scope of the project and I do charge extra for that. So if you don't establish clear guidelines um, and essentially boundaries, which is a really big thing for creative freelancers. Like, you don't want people to overstep your boundaries, but they don't know what those boundaries are unless you've communicated that with them. But if you don't establish those clear guidelines, you don't communicate those boundaries um, in terms around the scope of your project within your freelance contract, you don't have any real evidence to prove that you know, the, that the agreed upon deliverables have changed. So it's so important to incorporate these things in here. So by defining the scope, you can also establish a set ending point for the freelance contract when you have, you know, expectations for what the client needs to get you. Um, and once you've performed all of those tasks within the scope of your project, you are technically done. You've performed your part of the freelance contract and if your client wants you to perform other work then they need to set up a new contract for that additional work and not just expect it to be done as part of that initial contract. And it's also important that you are prepared to change your price or provide an additional estimate if you're asked to do anything outside of the agreed upon scope of that original contract. Your work is valuable, you are valuable, therefore it is important that you get paid for the work that you do. All right, I also include a section for changes and revisions. So very, very closely related to what's outlined in the scope of my projects, there's this other section where it's basically up to you to spell out how you'll be dealing with requested changes, requested revisions, or additions to your original freelance contract. Personally, I like to use very, very friendly writing here, um, but I, like I said earlier, I outlined that based on what I'm charging, this is how many changes, how many revisions the client will get, and that's it. Or I also add, if there are more requested revisions that are outside of the scope of my project, I'm happy to provide an additional estimate um, in order to be able to complete those. I wanna leave it open for the opportunity to add on those services, 
but I'm also not saying that I'm gonna do this for free and that's it. Um, so thankfully, most clients are really, really reasonable people and they're willing to do that. They completely understand. But the majority of freelance clients, at least in my experience, won't expect multiple edits and revisions beyond what's already outlined in the contract that they sign. Um, but as is life and as young Jenny had once experienced, there are some very picky people out there. And <laughs> um, sometimes there are people who never seem to be satisfied and constantly want you to change your work for free, of course. Um, but if you are outlining what you know your their needs are outlining what your goals are and outlining what the expectations are and you are very clear on how many revisions and changes that you have and they sign that contract that is what you are legally bound to do my standard freelance contract really allows clients to make changes if they wish um, beyond the initial two rounds of revisions that I include in it but like I said They'll have to pay for it if the requested changes come after I've already commenced work on specific deliverables. And if you're halfway through a project that has to be abandoned in order to follow a change in direction, this clause also makes it really clear that they'll still have to pay you for the work that you've already done. Okay, so the next section I want to highlight is the legal part. And like I said earlier at the very, very beginning of this video, I am not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, um, but years back when I first was creating and establishing my freelance business and I was creating my contracts, I, I basically um, consulted with a pro bono organization. If you are a creative in the Chicagoland area, you are running a small creative business, definitely, definitely look at and look into or reach out to the lawyers for the creative arts. They're an amazing organization. Um, an, orga an organization I learned about when I was in graduate school at Columbia College in Chicago. And they're just a fantastic resource for creatives in the city of Chicago and around the surrounding suburbs and areas. And the legal part, again, is really more or less protection. And it should be based around where you live and where you are from. And in my case, in the Chicago land area, Illinois. So typically I like to include two key things um, that offer some legal protection um, within my contract. And the legal section of your contract needs to protect you from that one in 100 situation, hopefully less, <laughs> where the unexpected does happen and something goes wrong with your client relationship, you don't get paid, um, a project doesn't go according to what your hopes were. Um, I like to include a provision that A, I'll get paid for the work that I've done. B, I can't be liable to the client um, or any third party for damages, including things like lost profits or lost savings or other incidental consequential special damages. Um, and even if a client has advised me of them, I am not liable for that. So I like to incorporate a clause for that. And if any provision basically of that contract is unlawful, void, or for any reason unenforceable, that provision should be deemed severable from the contract and should not affect the validity and the enforceability of the remaining provisions based on the laws in my specific state. I also like to highlight like I don't include a ton of horrible small print because I want it to be very, very clear based on what I'm outlining. Um, but I also like to include the idea that this contract can't transfer. Um, it stays in place and it doesn't need to be renewed um, for the specific project that I'm working on though. But if for some reason, you know, part of this becomes un unenforceable, the remaining parts are still intact. That way I can still get paid for the work that I do. Um, and also highlight that although the, the language is very simple in the contract that I use, um, the intentions are very serious and the contract is a legal document um, under exclusive jurisdiction of the state that I live in. Um, 
So again, I know the legal piece is, it's a little scary and it seems a little confrontational, but the reality is that this is what is meant to ensure that your contract is enforceable, that if anything negative could potentially happen, that you have something to fall back on and show that, you know, A and B was agreed upon, this is what was delivered, um, and that can make sure that you actually get paid for the work that you do. I also like to incorporate uh, information on copyright and outline that in my contract just because the work that I do is creative work um, and it doesn't necessarily always fall under the idea of like creative work for hire. Um, oftentimes when it comes to specific types of creative work, um, unless I'm selling the rights to my creations outright, um, I'm often going to be licensing them out for a specific number of uses. Um, especially when it comes to like the surface pattern design stuff. Um, and also even the creative stuff that I like to showcase in my portfolio. I like to outline that within the copyright section that I am allowed to utilize that to showcase my work for potential other clients. Um, and this is one of the more interesting features uh, of the US copyright law um, that I think is really, really important as a freelancer that we should pay attention to and that we should read and understand. Um, that's why I really like the pricing and ethical guidelines handbook from the Graphic Artists Guild. They do a fantastic job of outlining copyright ideas and, and things like that, trademark information and things like that in really easy to read and understand terms. One of the features of the copyright law is this idea of works made for hire. Um, the copyright law itself says that the concept of work made for hire can be very, very complicated. So in a nutshell, work made for hire explains that if a client contracts a freelancer to produce work and nothing is said about copyright ownership in any agreement, then the copyright actually belongs to the creator, not the person who pays for the work to be done. So as a freelancer, if you do work without any agreements in place, even if that is a paid project, you actually own the copyright to that work unless you have otherwise released it to the client. And that's why any savvy, like any savvy client will know about this quirk in copyright law. So if you don't have provision allowing for this in your freelance contract, expect the client to ask you to sign a version of their own of a copyright release at some point down the line. In your best interest to address it. Um, when it comes to my web and social media stuff, I have outlined that the copyright is owned by the client for all the material created under the agreement, um, but that as a contractor, I can showcase sample works from the project as a portfolio piece, um, of course, with consent and approval from the client, and that when they're signing that contract to me, how I outline my contract, they are signing consent and approval for me to be able to showcase it in things like YouTube videos or on my portfolio website. Obviously, when it comes to creative work, so illustration work, surface pattern design work, that's where things get a little bit trickier and you have to outline how you are using. So if you are just releasing and licensing out, you have to outline what that license entails, for what use the product can be um, used on, for how long, um, and again, if you're outright selling the copyright to a creative work, I would highly suggest that you charge more. If you're licensing things out, be very clear and explain how many things they can make. So, for example, if I'm using surface pattern design as the example, um, I create a set of surface pattern designs for a client, and they're using it for commercial use. I'm giving them permission to do it but it's only for up to 500 pieces of, you know, garments made with fabric using my surface pattern design. Anything more than that is going to cost this much more, and these are the royalties that I should be receiving on top of that when I'm licensing something out. So, all right, so one of the final pieces we're going to be talking about is payment. Money, 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 money. All right, so there's nothing worse than not getting paid for your hard work as a freelancer. There are some freelancers who have never experienced it. Young Jenny has. I know from experience that it's a terrible, terrible feeling. 
and you don't want to deal with that. This is why we're making contracts. So another <laughs> terrible thing is having payment delayed because a client wants to pay you through some complicated combination of money transferring services, you know, nothing derails the whole, you know, exciting aspect of working from home, <laughs> like being toyed with when it comes to getting paid. Um, so payment, where you're going to get paid, how you're going to get paid, how much you're going to get paid. This section is very, very vital in ensuring that you get paid for the work that you do. So not having a clear payment plan or term stipulated in your freelance contract kind of leaves you leaves room for clients to delay payment. Um, so in this specific section, I include what the client is paying me for what deliverables, when they're actually going to be delivered, when I expect those payments, specifically when I expect my deposit, when I expect my midpoint, and when I expect my final payment. Um, and I outlined a total amount, and then each of those payment amounts. Um, and I outlined specifically no later than whatever specific date I am expecting that payment from them. Um, so you may also choose to clearly state or list out acceptable payment terms, methods in the section as well. I like to use things like, you know, whether it be PayPal or Venmo or whatever other payment um, service provider you use. Uh, I like to outline those um, in this section. Second to last section is your termination. Um, obviously, no one likes to have something terminated, but this is kind of like your feel like your get out of jail card free. Um, the termination clause basically allows either party to exit the freelance contract in the event that the relationship is clearly not working out for any specific reason. Um, and then the final piece of the contract is the signatures. Um, it wouldn't be a contract without people signing on the bottom line. Um, and you need to have signatures of both yourself as well as the client. And that is basically it. Once you're done with the contract, of course you wanna export it, um, whether it be in PDF format or maybe you're sending over a Word document. I like to send over a PDF so that things can't be changed. Again, just an additional protection for yourself. Um, there are lots of different, you know, signature apps that you can use. Um, I use GoodNotes. Uh, there are others that you can use. There are apps for the iPhone. There's tons and tons and tons of apps that you can use to get a client to sign a contract. Um, or they can just do it the old fashioned way, print it out and then scan a copy in or take a picture with their phone and email it back to you. But getting those signatures is vitally important to basically closing out the contract so that both parties know what they're agreeing upon um, and what that entails. And basically you're now, you're done, you're at the finish line. Um, I always, always ensure that I get a contract back and signed before I begin any work for a client. Um, again, contracts are just a really great way to protect yourself. Um, as a freelancer, you don't want to get burned. You are an individual working for yourself, so you're allowed to create your your terms and what the expectations are. That's the beauty of being your own boss. Yeah, I hope you found this tutorial helpful. I know it's a little bit different, but I think the business aspect of this can be really muddled for some and often it can be confusing for creatives and it's so important that yes, while we are there to create, we wanna do the work that brings us joy, it's also important to protect ourselves in the sense um, and have an understanding of the business aspect of the bit you know of the creative business and yeah so i will see you in the next video i hope you found this informative i hope you take some time to create today and stay healthy talk to you guys soon bye